Howdy folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Desperado channel. This week's review is not steampunk. It is classic sci-fi because I've been alternating these back and forth. It's a series that I encountered on Reddit on the R Sci-Fi subreddit. It has quite a cult following, so I was surprised I hadn't heard of it before because there was a lot of real fanatic devotees of it. Never before I had encountered something that incorporated both Romantic era English poetry and Middle English literature into a sprawling sci fi epic. It's a bit like Dune, because Dune incorporated Islamic theology and some Central Asian history into its story. In this case, it didn't achieve quite the cult status as Dune, didn't have any movies made of it, but maybe it should. I'm talking about the Hyperion Cantos by Dan Simmons. Though the two series are quite different, Hyperion Cantos and Dune, they have a lot of similarities. They both involve a galaxy-spanning human civilization. They both have multiple volumes and uh, cover a lot of time a lot of centuries of time and action and, and great galaxy-spanning events. In the case of Simmons' work, it's a bit more literary, but both of them have very weighty topics that they're addressing. Now, the Hyperion Cantos has four books. It's a quadrology. The first two have a similar time frame, several centuries in our future, when the Earth has been destroyed and everybody's out on these different planets. And the second two books take place 275 years after the first book. So what happened to Earth? Well, it was destroyed in a lab accident. Somebody created a black hole and it accidentally ate the Earth's core. But luckily, Earth had already started colonizing other worlds, so the human race did survive. So at this point, when the first book starts, humans have created a galaxy-spanning civilization there are other intelligent species. You don't see this in every, in every one of these series. I mean, like Dune Foundation, you know, they don't really have these. But in this case, they do have other human and humanoid species, but they are not spacefarers. And the humans are kind of overwhelming them by colonizing their worlds. They do have, like, stargates. They have these farcaster portals that allow instantaneous transit from one planet to another. However, these are only the really civilized worlds. In order to have a stargate, or a farcaster portal, rather, you have to travel there and put one there. So it takes years to get there in order that you can have your instantaneous transit. They do have faster than light drive. They're called Hawking Drive, Mr. Stephen Hawking. But even though they're traveling faster than light, there is still the problem of the journeys taking months, weeks, or years, and the people on planet side age a lot faster than the people in the ship, so they call this time debt. People do extend their lives, however, with a technology called Paulson treatment, so people can live 200, maybe 300 years, pretty much tops. There are a few characters that have lived longer. Most of the really civilized worlds are in a kind of a cluster called hegemony, this uh, kind of very centralized but distributed government and several things they have in common with Dune is that they have banned AI, they've banished the AIs, they have gone off on their own they're called the Technocore and they, in, they live in some other dimension they also have banned androids which are basically human biological uh, robots because they kind of fear them and they're only allowed on frontier worlds where they may be needed. The Technocore is this group of AIs that became all powerful and have their own kind of like data sphere, a galactic internet, where they live. Some want to protect humanity, others want to destroy it. There are also the Ousters. Uh, these are people who aren't part of the hegemony. They live out on their own. They are kind of space vagabonds, mostly living in ships or on asteroids. They are adapted to low gravity and they are genetically engineering themselves to be fit for harsh environments. And the hegemony people perceive them as a savage enemy, a threat. 
Now, the current action in Book 1 takes place on the kind of frontier world of Hyperion. Frontier in a sense it's not part of the Hygienomy. They don't have a Farcaster portal of any sort. Based on Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, they do have the different pilgrims telling their stories. Uh, it's, in this case, there are only six instead of twenty odd, like in Chaucer's. And in this case, they also kind of advance the story. Now, in Hyperion, it is a religious pilgrimage, but not on the part of the pilgrims. They're all there to solve a problem or to find something out. The church in this case is called the Church of the Final Atonement, which is this weird cult that worships this monster called the Shrike. The Shrike is a 10-foot-tall creature that pops in and out of existence. It's kind of legendary, kind of a legendary boogeyman. It lives only on Hyperion in certain parts, and it'll appear out of nowhere and kill people, and very painfully, because it'll impale them with its spiky hands, and uh, it can't be destroyed, and it can't be evaded. It's just kind of <laughs> like a, a demon, basically. And a Shrike, in real life, is a butcher bird. <laughs> it's a bird that takes insects and puts them for safekeeping. It, it kind of hangs them on a thorn. <laughs> it's kind of funny. And so it's a good analogy. The six pilgrims, in this case, like in Canterbury Tales, are all known by their profession. In this case, it's the warrior, the scholar, the detective, the poet, the priest, and the consul. And that's a Catholic priest, by the way. And now, the, and the consul is like a hegemony ambassador, kind of, sort of a retired, but they're all looking for something important, some, something specific, uh, like there's one man whose daughter is aging backwards. She caught the malady on Hyperion, so he's brought her back here to try and cure her. And then there's the poet who just is looking for inspiration, <laughs> basically. But they've all been chosen by the Church of the Final Atonement to go to these time tombs, which is their holy site. Uh, this abandoned place which is supposedly moving backwards in time. The travel for the pilgrimage is low-tech because they can't use aircraft to approach the time tombs. Not only is it forbidden, but people who go there mysteriously disappear. So they have to go on land or on the rivers. They have a river boat for a while. They have to uh, ride beasts for a while. They have to have this um, wind wagon, which is a sailing, sailing wagon that uh, goes from the prairie. Pretty cool. Sounds very steampunk. Anyway, on the, on the journey, they each tell of their stories because none of them knows each other, and, and we find out why they're there. And they're very different stylistically. I mean, the priest is telling this kind of horrific story of his predecessor who came to Hyperion, and, and which he's trying to investigate. Uh, the uh, scholars is very sad about the, the daughter. Uh, the um, poet is very profane. <laughs> he's a hedonist. He's a womanizer. He's a drunkard. And, and he's like... 400 years old. <laughs> oh, no, more than that, because he's, he's actually was born on old earth. So each of them is seeking something. And the current action alternates with the stories, which, as I said before, and the planet's name comes from the poetry of John Keats. Yes, that John Keats, the Romantic Era poet. As does the city of Endymion, which gives the second two books it, their names. Keats is actually a character. He is resurrected as a cybrid, a cyber hybrid, uh, by the Technocore, who are doing these weird experiments with human history. And the, the Technocore, they have these different factions. So one faction is after the first Keats and kills the first Keats, and they have a second Keats, and it is complicated. The detective, Bron Lamia, is investigating the murder of the first cybrid, John Keats, and she becomes the lover of the second cybrid, John Keats. So it's all kind of interesting. Second book continues those same six pilgrims, but it gets into the action that happens after they reach the time tombs and all hell breaks loose. And there's these galaxy shattering events, and it's like a threat to the hegemony, and you know, all the uh, space navies are involved, and the Shrike pops in and out and kills people and tortures people and all that stuff. So it's, it's a lot of action in that one. And John Keats! <laughs> Second pair of books, as I said, 275 years later. That involves partly time travel and partly just longevity. The poet 
Martin Silenus is still alive. He's like a thousand years old by this point. And he recruits this guy, this um, kind of independent adventurer type, Rawl Endymion from Hyperion, to be this uh, protector, rescuer and protector of the prophet Aenea, a prophesied prophet <laughs> who is supposed to come out of the time tunes right about now. And she has traveled forward in time, and she is the child of the detective Bronlania and John Keats. And she's supposed to tell humanity how to save itself. Uh, she's supposed to give them all this wisdom. There are people who want to kill her and prevent her from spreading her message, particularly the Catholic Church. Now, the Church is portrayed positively in the first two books. The Church is nearly extinct, and they're just trying to help people and uh, do the best they can. In the second two books, they are corrupted by this weird alien uh, technology they discover. Technology, creature, whatever. It's this parasite that they discover on the world Hyperion. It's shaped like a cross. They call it the cruciform. You put it on your body, it melts into you, and it makes you immortal. Because if anything kills you, you are brought back to life, reassembled with your memories in three days. <laughs> a lot of Christian symbolism here. And the Catholic Church has heard the prophecy and they know that Aenea is a threat. Now, where do the cantos come in, you may ask? Well, those are the poems of Martin Silenus. He's been writing poems uh, about these journeys, about Hyperion, about the journey of the pilgrims and so on. And so he's trying to complete these poems that, that have this history. And so after Raul rescues Aenea, he can finish them because we'll see what's going to happen. And of course the church bans these, these poems. They're blasphemous. So anyway, the second two books begins with Aenea as a 12-year-old girl. Raul rescues her and becomes her protector and travels with her. Later on, they become lovers. I know that sounds a little creepy, a little Woody Allen-esque, but I think Simmons tries to make it less creepy. I'll get into that a little bit later. So, a little bit about Simmons. Until he was a full-time writer, he was an elementary school teacher. <laughs> and he started telling some of these stories to his students. Now, that was a little disturbing because these stories have a lot of elements of horror, a lot of violence and bloodshed and pain and misery. But I'm thinking that he probably had them toned down a lot when he was telling them. And later on, after he became a full-time writer, he got mostly into horror, which is probably why I don't know him. The Hyperion Cantos were really his sci-fi works. He mostly did horror and historical fiction, and some, some uh, combinations thereof. But it was cool because right at the gate, he won awards out of Hi the Hyperion books, and I'm very jealous. Book one, Hyperion, 1989, won both the Hugo and Locus Awards. It centers on the pilgrimage. Six pilgrims, each of whom tell their stories, each of whom are seeking something. There's actually a seventh pilgrim, but he's more of a guide. He doesn't get to tell his story. Those stories uh, are most of the book, but also the current action. And there is some you know, danger and excitement and violence and so on. Second book, Fall of Hyperion, 1990, won the British Science Fiction and Locus Awards. This takes place right after the previous book, but in this one, Simmons abandons the frame story structure, you know, which means the story of stories. And what happens is when the time tombs get opened up, when the pilgrims arrive there at the holy site, all sorts of hell breaks loose. The Shrike appears, he pops in and out of existence, he starts murdering people, and uh, they are, uh, there is all this revolution and war in the he hegemony, and they're trying to stave off this, all this um, chaos that's happening, and eventually, you know, there's a dramatic conclusion, but I won't get into it, of course. Third book, Endymion, 1996. Nominated for the Locus Award. This one didn't win any, I guess, any, any major ones. In this one, the, the poet Martin Salinas is still alive. He's like a thousand years old. He's been in cold sleep, or I guess chronic fugue, they call it, 
cryogenic fugue for many of those years. But he is very decrepit. He's like being kept alive by machines. His only purpose is to see the story play out. He recruits this local hunting guide named Raul Endymion, who is uh, on Hyperion, to rescue and safeguard the girl prophet Aenea, who has been prophesied. She's going to arrive, emerge from the time tombs right about now. And he's supposed to protect her from the forces who want to capture or kill her. Now, there's a lot of excitement and adventure, but most of it's told through the viewpoint of Raul Endymion. Although, some of those viewpoints he shouldn't be able to access. Because it's all like it's a memoir, and he's in prison, and, and he's going to be executed by, obviously, the powers that be. Final book is Rise of Endymion, 1997, won the Locus Award, and it's still told by Raul Endymion, so obviously he hasn't been killed yet. This continues the story of Raul and Nia, uh, and their conflict with the church, and their flight from their persecution. And Nia's teachings turn into religion. And her DNA also holds the key to the salvation of humanity. Again, more Christian symbolism. Pros and cons. There are some pretty clever ideas that went into the writing of these books, especially book one with its its frame story structure. It's interesting how he has both those stories, which are which are compelling in themselves, very different in structure and character, and also moving the story forward in an exciting way because they face danger as they go to the time tombs. I may get more people in, interested in great literature and poetry, which I very much advocate. We need to keep in touch with our Western, that is European heritage. And another writer who did that was Tim Powers, who did a lot about Byron and Shelley, also from that era. There are some clever plot devices, not entirely original, I'm sure, but the reverse aging is handled very cleverly, and it's very heartbreaking for the parents of the girl. Uh, incredible world building, or shall I say galaxy building, with a complex uh, series of planets, uh, and varied and interesting characters, including a Palestinian soldier. And I feel a lot of sympathy for the Palestinians. I'll probably get in trouble for saying that. I don't care. And by the way, there's also a very sympathetic Jewish character in the book, who is the scholar who is trying to find a cure for his daughter who is aging backwards. Uh, exciting action, a few surprises, which is difficult to surprise me, and cyberpunk elements. This was written at the dawn of the internet. So he did kind of go with that, and which was a good, good call. <laughs> some horror elements. Some people won't like it. I enjoyed it to the degree that they were in there. Cons. Too wordy, too long. This appears in a lot of the reviews that I see of this series. He really gets into detail, and it really gets into a lot of musings that don't necessarily belong. The Raleigh Endymion, he's under attack, and he's thinking about how much he loves Aenea. No, 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 this is not the time. It's that kind of thing. But, you know, he just overdoes it a little bit. Still, it's very pretty, it's very poetic language at times. The first book structure, although clever, although very creative, makes it frustrating in the sense that I wanted to see what happened to the pilgrims more than I wanted to see what their backstories were. The second book has a bit of a surplus of characters. Interestingly, though, it is told from the viewpoint of the John Keats Cybrid. <laughs> <laughs> who has dreams about them. <laughs> it's, yeah, interesting. The Technocore is a bit of a Dies Ex Machina. Did I say that right? They kind of have all powers, and so they can do all these things, as well as the Shrike. He's kind of an element that just can just pop in here and there whenever the plot needs him. Uh, some of the tech terms are a little outdated. My favorite, Bubble Memory. Most of you probably haven't heard of it, but I'm old enough to have worked with bubble memory. It was a real thing. It's very outdated, it's obsolete, but uh, he does mention it, which is hilarious. Some might see Rawls' relationship with Aenea as creepy, as I said before. Simmons has uh, kind of worked around it. For one thing, uh, at one point in the story, uh, Rawls goes on a space trip, he doesn't age, she does, so she's a lot closer in age to him when he arrives on the world where she's staying. And she's kind of she's kind of pressing the relationship too because she feels that it's destined. 
that they are destined to be together. Finally, Aeneas' religion is a little bit underwhelming. <laughs> the philosophy is just kind of, I don't know, it's kind of a series of homilies, you know, living life to the fullest and being yourself and that sort of thing. I mean, some of it's a little, little odd. Strangely enough, she's also an architect, <laughs> and uh, which, which, uh, which brings to mind Ayn Rand uh, and uh, the Fountainhead <laughs> and her obsession with Frank Lloyd Wright, who also appears as a cybrid in the Hyperion books. And so, a lot of stuff. There's a lot to process here. So, I do recommend it. I would give the books anywhere from uh, four and a half to three and a half years, depending upon the book. And I'm not going to go into it. I've gone long enough. But I do recommend it to anybody who has the patience to read a sprawling sci-fi epic. If they're just into pulp, sci-fi, shoot 'em ups you know, like Star Wars action or something like that, it's not the book for you. But if you do like something that's very literary and very thoughtful and very, um, very creative, this is the series for you. Please let me know what you think about Hyperion and this review of it in the comments below. I know you're out there. I know you fanatic Hyperion people are out there. So please let me know. Please give me suggestions. Please like and subscribe because we want to, uh, we want this channel to grow. Also, please check out my books on Amazon. I'll include the links in the description below. For now, this is Steampunk Desperado saying, Adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.